Greetings, everybody. I hope that you enjoy this short film that I've made for your viewing pleasure. Before we go into the actual film, I would like to give you a short introduction as to what you are about to see. My name is Kevin Garner. 20 years ago, in April of 2001, I had a restless night. I woke up at like 1, 2 in the morning. Couldn't sleep. So I just felt inspired to start writing. And as I wrote, I wrote about the influences of good and evil how we are given choices every day and how we react to these choices and the decisions that we make. Recently, I met a complete stranger at my workplace. This fellow came in, cowboy hat, cowboy boots, bib overalls, beard down to here. We struck up a conversation. We really seemed to hit it off. We liked one another. And I asked him before he left, I said, hey, uh, would you take a look at this, this thing I wrote 20 years ago? I don't know why, but I have it in my car. So he took it home, he read it, his wife read it, he read it again. He called me. He said, listen, you didn't know I was a pastor of a church, did you? I said, no, sir, I did not. He said, I'm a pastor of a small church in Eberle, Illinois, and I would like you to bring this play to my church. And I said, I would be honored. So we did that. That led into a play in my hometown in Casey, Illinois, at a church there. And we did the play there. People seemed to like it. That led into several other churches inviting us to do the play. So we've decided to make the film. So with that said, God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. We know that. What you are about to see, this is about a man, like many of us, who has gotten too big for his britches. Remember, folks, pride before the fall. I bring to you the interview. Good evening and welcome once again to another episode of This Crazy Universe starring your host and world acclaimed reporter and interviewer. You all know this man. This man has interviewed athletes, movie stars, the rich and the famous, CEOs of major corporations. This man has interviewed kings and queens, United States presidents. This man has interviewed everybody who's anybody in our entire world. Please, ladies and gentlemen, stand on your feet and let's give a big warm welcome to Nathaniel G. Anderson! Ladies and gentlemen, we have got a hell of a show for you tonight, so I want to get right on into it. Because I have secured an exclusive with the one, the only, Satan himself. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Lucifer is in the house tonight. And we're going to get to know him a little bit. So without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Satan to the stage. Satan, it's a pleasure to have you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here today. Yeah. Yeah. I will try to answer all of your questions in a fair and honest way, which is totally against my character. Now, Satan, you've agreed to look at seven people that we've chosen at random, and you're going to give us a little sneak peek at how you affect their lives. Now, before we get into that, I just gotta know, why the number seven? Well, Nat, I'm gonna call you Nat because it is very demeaning and degrading to call you Nat, so Nat it is. <laughs> well, Nat, the number seven is God's number. And what a better way to make a mockery of God than to use the number seven. Now, before we do get into that, though, I do have a few questions that I want to ask you so that our viewers can get to know you a little better. Ooh. On the contrary, Nat, I think your viewers know me just fine. You see, it's very plainly written in the Holy Bible 
that if you're not serving Jesus, then you're serving me. So most of your television viewers are already my disciples. Jesus himself says you cannot serve but more than one master. Now, <laughs> you seem to know a little bit about the Holy Bible. Why is that? Think about it, Nat. A great general does not send his troops into battle without first knowing the strengths of his enemies. He's not a great coach of a football team, first like to scout the plays of the opposing team. Nat, I make it my business to know the Bible inside and out. That way I can twist and deceive every word of it. That's where I'm superior to you humans. I have more of a desire to learn the written word of the Holy Bible than most preachers. Now what would you say to those who don't believe in you? They think you're some sort of fairy tale. A boogeyman, if you will. Good. That way they won't see me coming like a hungry lion to devour them. And what about those atheists who don't even believe in God? Same answer as the last one. Good. Again, it's very plainly written in Luke chapter 12, verse 8. Jesus says, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will also be disowned before the angels of God. See, I love it when your top scientists can take a little miracle of God and assure their whole human race with it. Now what could you possibly mean by that? Look, Nat, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be Satan. You just have to be on your toes and wait for the right time and people to come along. And then BOOM! You have the Big Bang Theory, the theory of evolution. The genius of it all is I took one of God's little miracles, like the tadpole evolving to the frog, and then ran with it. You see, if I can convince you people that you came from the lowest of the low, the glob of the ocean floor, then how can you possibly love yourself, let alone one another? I believe it was Khrushchev who said, Give me the children and I will win the war. Well, that's it in a nutshell. Kids today are being taught that there is no creator, an all-knowing and all-loving God which they are created in his likeness. So no wonder you have kids killing kids. See, I must admit it's... It's weird that you seem to speak about God with some sort of, albeit, odd admiration. Why is that? Nat, if anybody's going to believe in God the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, it is I who have spoken firsthand with him. He scares the hell out of me. <clears throat> A little pun. <laughs> but it's true. He could have smashed me in an instant. But instead... For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 You see, Nat, God wishes that no one should perish. I'm just surprised that you speak so highly of it. Well, Nat, he is the Most High. That is precisely why I'm condemned to eternal hell, because I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be God. But I'm already defeated.
I mean, I was a little amused when he sent Jesus to battle me. I thought, was this some kind of joke? I mean, a mere human had never even become remotely close to challenge me, especially with all the baggage of all the people of the whole entire world. Imagine that. That's B.C. time and A.D. time. Matt, think of your deepest fears, scariest moments, worst feelings, deepest sorrows, the most un bearable pain you have ever felt, and then combine that all together and take that from all of the peoples of the world and then carry that on your shoulders. Even I'm amazed by that. That's precisely what my Lord and your Savior did when he walked the earth in the form of a human for 33 and a half years. Then when he carried that old rugged cross up to that hill to Calvary, while well, a band of 10,000 angels were looking on him to save their Lord God. I was terrified when I saw those legions of angels just itching to save their Lord God. I thought I had finally won whenever they never came to stop the beating and torturous things that his own children, who he came here for, were doing to him. I rejoiced so merrily with my fellow demons. For three days, that is. That's when reality set in. And I had realized I had been defeated for good. I just try to inflict as much damage and destruction as I can before Jesus comes in the second coming to apprehend me and bind me to the eternal hell that was created for me and my fellow demons. The only satisfaction I get is taking as many of you with me as I can. Because I know it pains God terribly. And when is he coming back? <laughs> <laughs> Look, stupid! You kill me! Doesn't that hot reporter and interviewer in America know how to read the written word? The answer is soon, and very soon. Jesus himself even says it over and over again in the book of Revelations. Behold, I am coming like a thief in the night. Behold, I am coming soon. The answer not is in the twinkling of an eye. The exact time? Well, I wish I knew. But the Bible tells us that no one knows the day, nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven, only God Almighty. Now, Satan, you are powerful, and, to put it lightly, a bit of a trickster. <laughs> but what would you say is your greatest weapon against us? The Bible tells you that no weapon formed against you can cause you harm from me, as long as you have Jesus in your heart. You know, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but there is one thing I like to use against you people all the time, over and over again. And that's the freedom that God gave you to choose, so that you're not puppets on a string. You see, Nat, I fell from grace by the power of choice, so naturally I use it against you. You have the freedom to choose to accept God's love or reject it. The power to love God and others more than self 
or love self more than others. You see, Nat, oh, by the way, Nat, I hate you, and I cannot wait to destroy you. Anyways, back to your question. <laughs> Every day, people have choices to make. But they make bad choices because of deception, stubbornness, selfish pride, which coincidentally is words you might use to describe me, Nat. So I guess choice is my greatest weapon against your people. And what do you view as our greatest weakness? That's simple. You're starving to death. Well. Not literally. <laughs> you see, it's human nature that when people are hungry, they become irrational. Then they become selfish and conniving. Then when the hunger pains really set in, they become downright vicious. So, I simply starve them from the word of God, the Holy Bible. You see, it's a strange and funny thing to see people starving to death when there's food all around them. But again, Nat, you see, this is where choice comes into play. People would rather starve to death and watch their kids starve to death than to eat the abundance of the spiritual food that is all around them. You see, God is an awesome chef, but an awesome chef can cook the greatest meals, which he has in the Holy Bible, but you cannot shove it down their throats or ugh, throw it back up. You see, people have to eat small, regular-sized portions on a daily basis for the rest of their lives to survive. Very simple, man. Very simple. <laughs> now, Satan, I was talking with my producers before you arrived, and we were wondering if we can get your thoughts on what you think about America. America, the beautiful. <laughs> well, not. When America, the proud and mighty nation, first became a nation, I was horrified. No, no, seriously, Nat. I had my demons working overtime. I was in absolute freak mode. When I first read the uh, original Constitution of the United States, I just knew I was doomed. But it didn't take long for you geniuses to find a way to louse that up. Kids are being taught in school today that their forefathers were derelict. Just like the evolution thing. See a pattern here, Nat? Kids cannot have any pride in themselves as a Christian nation because they're being taught that their great-great-grandfathers were losers and deranged men. Bigots. Racists. Ooh, how I love that one. Speaking of racism, do you think there's a racism problem in America? How do you think I con one third of angels out of heaven? <laughs> I simply convinced them that they were being discriminated against. Does the phrase, united we stand, divided we fall, ring a bell? It was your forefather who said it, and you've probably been told that it does not apply to you. But Jesus says it in the book of Luke, in chapter 11, verse 17. Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. What do you think I thrive on racial conflict? I especially get a kick out of all those demonstrators of all race and color who march in the name of Jesus, who cause so much hate and 
discontent. Now, Satan, earlier you mentioned about kids killing kids. Do you think we have a gun problem in America? Ooh. I just love that one. I've already explained it to you earlier about this whole school shooting things and why I love it, but I'll give you a few more reasons. You ready? Here goes. Everybody wants to blame the parents or the gun. Cain slew Abel with a rock, not a Smith and Wesson. I have the media in my back pocket. Not every member of the media, but the media as a whole. I got a lot of stock and barrel. They always want to blame the parents. They never want to blame me. They are my allies. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve made a bad choice. And what was the first thing they did? Was blame each other. Now Satan where are you sending your demons, like the most of your demons, at any given moment? Duh. The churches. Why would I need to attack the rest of the world with such great force? They're already serving me. You can bet I have one of my highest ranking officers at every church, every Sunday morning. You see, I want to know who's going, where they live, and who their kids are. Although I do have to have a fresh group of kamikazes every Sunday because the song and worship and prayer ah, is just, it's just unbearable to us. Okay. Um... Now, Satan, it is time for us to move on. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, but it's time for us to move on to our next segment, which is the seven volunteers that we have located at random across the entire United States. And then you are going to give us a little peek behind the curtain about how you affect them. First up, we have James. Now, James is a successful businessman, a devoted father of two, and he's married to a beautiful woman. What do you have on James? Oh, James. <laughs> He's so predictable. You see, James wants to the Lord. He's still washed by the blood, but if I can do anything to destroy him, hopefully it will keep anyone that he's associated with from knowing the Lord. You see, I simply entice him with Pornography. He has the American dream, but he'll throw it all away for some pretty girl and want nothing more than his money. But I've also been working on his wife. Their sex life has dwindled, and worse yet, she's in more in love with their kids than with them. <laughs> you see, that's where choice comes into play. He chooses to look the other way. She chooses to hate him, and chooses to hurt him, and chooses to feel inadequate. She is an independent woman. I just love that Helen Reddy song, but I like to change the words when I sing it to, I am Satan, hear me roar. All right. 
Right. Well, next up, we've got Jill. Now, Jill is a high school student. She struggled a little bit. Her about a C average student right now, and unfortunately, her parents are divorced. What do you have on Jill? Ah, uh, yes, Jill. You see, I started working on Jill when she was only three years old. She was wider than snow in God's eyes, so I couldn't touch her until she became the age of accountability. So I did the next best thing. I started working on her parents. You see, they had a bad habit of bringing up the word Divorce in their arguments. The spoken word is so very powerful. Neither one of them wanted a divorce, but it was leverage and a way to get at each other, so it was used. Eventually, the word love was never used at all. It only took me four years to destroy them. But the real prize was Jill. You see, now Jill is 16 years old, and her parents deserted her when she was only seven. Now, I don't mean that they abandoned her. I mean that they prostituted her out for child support money and to get at each other on their holidays. They never showed Jill the love and importance for being Jill. Her mother showed her that she was only important to keep around to make that new car payment with her child support money. Her father said that because of her, that when he lost his job at the factory, that all of his overtime went to child support money anyways. So now he's in jail because of her, because he could not pay the child support money. Now, Jill has had sex with numerous boys and men and has been into drugs since she was 13. And in about five minutes, she's going to take her own life with a single gunshot to the temple. <laughs> Oh, you just gotta love that one. I know I do. Are you serious? Told you I'd be honest. Get someone out of the house right now. I don't care. Now! Do it! Fine, get out. Do the show. I wonder if you were to know that uh, we are sending emergency response people to her house right now to check on Jill. Uh, my producers are insisting that we continue with the interview in case any other potentially shocking developments occur. Um, Good luck. <laughs> Next up, um, we have Sally. Uh, Sally is a single mother, devoted, uh, loving mother of three children. Uh, that she's had from Sally beats her kids for the least reason. Sally hates herself, so naturally she hates anyone who tries to love her. She also hates men. Her oldest child is a boy, so he really gets it. And Sally is never to blame for anything. And her parents, oh, good Christian parents, oh, they just love to spoil the only child, will not put their foot down to her because they themselves were afraid of her. They were afraid that if they tell the truth that they will not see Sally or their grandchildren. So naturally, they go to church to pray to God to help them. 
but every time they do, they are serving me because of that little word. Yep, you guessed it, choice. They made bad choices, bring her up, and they will continue to make bad choices because everything you people do is habit for me. They are certainly not loving Sally in the way that God intended for a parent to love their child with instructions in the way that they must go. Our next... Um, our next volunteer is Jennifer. She is a widow, and unfortunately she is dying of cancer. Why don't you tell us about Jennifer? Matt, that's a tough one. See, she herself is not a Christian. But she has a lot of people and a lot of churches praying for her. I'm working double time on her right now. Bob is currently unemployed and has been for a few years now. And he describes himself as always being the life of the party wherever he goes. What do you got on Bob? Oh, Bob, Bob, Bob. Everybody loves Bob. He is the life of the party. He's lazy, which is a sin, you know. He's also hooked to the bottle. And his father was hooked to the bottle, and his father beat him severely as a youth. So now Bob goes overboard to get the positive attention instead of the negative attention that he grew up with. <laughs> Bob went so badly to be delivered from all of this, but he insists on hanging out with the current crowd that he's with. So Bob probably won't make the correct choice or the commitment to serve the Lord. Although the Lord is watching over Bob at every party, waiting patiently. George is a retired construction worker. He is a father, a grandfather, and a self-made man. What do you have on George? George, George, George. George is a hard worker, a great friend, a great neighbor, a great father and grandfather, and all around great guy. But you see, Nat, a lot of great guys are going to miss out on heaven because man cannot make it on works alone, but only through the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. You see, George hates churches because of a few bad experiences, which I could take credit for. George also thinks that all churches are hypocrites and sinners. Hello? Wake up, George. Tell us something we don't know. Even the Bible tells us that. George, if churches weren't filled with hypocrites and sinners, they would already be perfect. George, when was the last time you kept pouring gasoline inside of your pickup truck when it was already overflowing? Of course, church is filled with empty and half-empty tanks. If George would just think that it takes money to, to flip that light switch, heat that building, feed those homeless, put gas in those church vans to pick up those children who will not get love for the rest of the week, and on and on. So yeah, I got George right where I want him. As long as he thinks that he's a 
great guy and better than those churchgoers. Then you see George is the real hypocrite. <laughs> well, our last volunteer is Joe. Joe, well, Joe is a preacher. So you two ought to get along just fine. Nat, I got more demons working on Joe than anyone in his congregation. You see, he's the real catch. If I can get him to fall, I can get them all to fall. You're only as good as your leader. Nat, I place more bickering more temptations on him than anyone can bear, but he holds firm with the Lord. He believes that God will not place on more than what he can handle. He truly loves the Lord. I'm about to give up on him. He believes without a shadow of doubt. And also, the Holy Spirit rebukes my demons when they get too near. All right, Satan. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. I do want to thank you for showing up. And do you have anything you'd like to say to our viewers before we let you go? No. Just to you, Nat. You should have never let me get this close to you. I got through to you through your selfish ambitions to be the top reporter and interviewer in America at any cost. The ratings I got you were your downfall, Matt. You played right into my hands with your big, arrogant hand. And that little word, you guessed it, choice. I couldn't believe my ears when you wanted to interview me over God. But I guess you're like all the other Americans in a new land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Goodbye, America. See you soon, Satan. What you have seen here today, folks, is real. It's very real. Life and death is very real. Satan is very real. Our living God is very real. This is a story about choice. The choices that we made, the choices that we didn't make. My hope is that after viewing this film, that you will share it with your friends and family. And that when you are forced with decisions, that you will make the right choice. Remember, the choice is yours. I don't know, Lord, why you chose me And I don't know what I've done To make you love me so much To give up your only son When I was lost and weary so broken in defeat It was you, Lord, that restored me As I knelt at your feet I didn't understand your love I chose that wild road I couldn't 
comprehend how many blessings you bestowed It took me falling on my face time and time again I did not serve you, my Lord, I only served my sin Now my eyes are open and I am so much ashamed I rejected you, my Lord, I only am to blame I fooled around, I treated life just like a foolish game Through it all, my Father, you loved me all the same you my lord please answer this for me how could you forgive my sins and set this captor free knowing it was me my lord who nailed you to that tree